This is As Black as Resistance, Chapter 1, Black and Anarchy. The United States has experienced cycles of tyranny since its inception. For some, the United States represents only this experience. A disillusioned liberal establishment has begun to worry that this country might be losing its democracy. However, the democracy that some feared to lose was never achieved for many of us in the first place. The ability to participate in U.S. society has been an ongoing struggle for the descendants of the colonized, enslaved immigrants and asylum seekers. The U.S. empire has caused trauma endlessly from the first moment it existed. Frederick Douglass asserted, What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him, more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty an unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. We must expand the scope of Douglas's question beyond celebrations of national independence. We who rightly take issue with the national project must also ask, is the American Revolution the singular purposefully romanticized tale of wealthy landowners refusing taxation and splitting from the British crown? Or is there another potential American Revolution that has yet to occur? It is deeply ironic that we are taught the glories of the U.S. birth through revolutionary resistance to the British Empire, but today... But told today, we must not resist, must not be revolutionary, and need to resolve differences through reason, dialogue, and civic engagement. Equating a revolt to escape unfair monarchical taxes to real revolution was a perversion of the concept of revolution itself. How revolutionary were men who saw no problems with enslavement and citizenship based on white manhood and land ownership? This revolution served white supremacist patriotism and the suppression of dissent. Revolt is at the foundation of the United States, yet now patience and cooperation are presented as the only acceptable ways to address inequity. The very ideals at the foundation of the state are denounced, while the state itself monopolizes the right to, quote, legitimate revolutionary change, just as it monopolizes the right to, quote, legitimate uses of force and self-defense. After all, the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence reads, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain un- unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Black people entered the settler colony through transatlantic kidnapping, chattel trade, being bought and sold as property, and forced servitude. Indigenous genocide and land expropriation and enclosure are intrinsic to the American settlement. And the use of black labor was responsible for settler agricultural expansion and the growth of the southern agrarian economy. Once successfully cleared and claimed by white settlers, Native land would be mixed with black labor to produce cotton, the white gold of the Deep South. It is through the institution of slavery that black people entered the American social contract. Slavery, forced servitude, was imposed upon black people throughout the United States, and blackness thus became a marker of that enslavement that would continue even after slavery's demise. Race in the United States evolved not only as a social identity, but also a property relation, which was codified in the American legal system, and within the social contract itself. Inherent to liberal social contract values, it is the simultaneous maintenance 
of white supremacy's capital interests signified by anti-indigenous and anti-black exclusions and the purported values of equality. Liberalism pays lip service to egalitarianism while contemplating and structurally lending itself to fascistic logics and political enroachments. Societal fascism describes the process and political logics of state formation where an entire populations are excluded or ejected from the social contract, pre-contractually excluded because they have never been part of a given social contract and will never be, or they are ejected from a contract they were previously part of and are only able to enjoy conditional inclusion at best. This differs from the political fascism represented, for example, by the regimes of Benito Mussolini, Francisco Franco, Adolf Hitler, and others. Nevertheless, lends itself to the formation of a political system easily susceptible to authoritarianism because it is grounded in inequity and inequality and marked by political mechanisms and a popular consensus that allows rights and liberties to legally be taken away in the event that individuals and communities are ejected from the social contract. Black Americans are residents of a settler colony, not truly citizens of the United States. Despite a constitution laden with European Enlightenment values and a document of independence declaring certain unalienable rights, black existence was legally that of private property until post-bell emancipation. The black American condition today is an evolved condition directly connected to the history of slavery, and that will, and that will continue to be the case as long as the United States remains an ongoing settler project. Nothing short of a complete dismantling of the American state as it presently exists, can or will disrupt this. As Hortense Spillers makes explicit in her influential work Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American grammar story, blackness was indelibly marked and transformed through the transatlantic slave trade. European colonialism and the process of African enslavement, both as profit-maximizing economic institution and a dehumanizing institution, can be regarded as high crimes against the flesh, as the person of African females and males registered the wounding. Crimes against the flesh are not simply crimes against the corporal self. The wounded flesh, rather, was the personhood and social position of the African. The wounding is a process of blackening through subjugation, a wound from which black people and blackness writ large have yet to recover. Recovery, a positive reassertion of identity, is impossible. We are black because we are oppressed by the state. We are oppressed by the state because we are black. Black existence within the social contract is existence within a heavily regulated state, a state in which our emancipation from enslavement was not a singular event or a moment of true actualization of freedom, but rather a state-sanctioned transition from forced servitude to anti-black subjection and exclusion. We are carriers of the coveted blue passport still trapped in the zone of citizen non-being, a zone where we are not fully disappeared and eliminated but where we are still denied the opportunity and ability to self-determine, a state of precarity that only allows for the conditional survival of particular bodies in particular ways. Franz Fanon writes, the zone where the natives live is not complementary to the zone inhabited by the settlers. The two zones are opposed, but not in the service of a higher unity. Obedient to the rules of pure Aristotelian logic, they both follow the principle of reciprocal exclusivity, no conciliation is possible for, of the two terms, one is superfluous. The settler's town is a strongly built town, all made of stone and steel. It is a brightly lit town. The streets are covered with, with asphalt, and the garbage cans swallow all the leavings, unseen, unknown, and hardly thought about. The settler's feet are never invisible, except perhaps in the sea, but there you're never close enough to see them. His feet are protected by strong shoes, although the streets of his town are clean and even with no holes or stones. The settler's town is a well-fed town, an easy-going town. Its belly is always full of good things. The settler's town is a town of white people, of foreigners. The town is belonging to the colon the town belonging to the colonized people, or at least the native town, the Negro village, the Medina, the reservation, is a place of ill fame, peopled by men of evil repute. They are born there. It matters little where or how. They die there. It matters not where or nor how. It is a world without spaciousness. Men live there on top of each other. Their huts are built one on top of the other. The native town is a hungry town, starved of bread, of meat, of shoes, of coal, of light. The native town is a crouching village, a town on its knees, a town wallowing in the mire. It is a town of N-words and dirty Arabs. 
This world divided into compartments, this world cut in two, is inhabited by two different species. Within this zone, blackness is constantly under surveillance. This is not simply an allusion to the state's little surveillance programs like Cohen's Pro, the covert FBI program that destroyed so many mid-20th century black radical efforts. We refer rather to settler colonial arrangements in anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity that co-create the framework for state racial formations. The mechanisms comprising anti-black violence were foundational to post-9-11 war on terror securitizations of Muslim, immigrant, and refugee communities across the United States. These suspensions of rights and civil liberties in favor of order are not new. They are rather being explicitly applied to another racialized group both domestically and in U.S. foreign policy. Where Islamism constitutes the enemy abroad, blackness is a perpetual enemy at home. Islamophobic and anti-black logics become complementary and also inextricably linked where the first Muslims in the United States were enslaved West Africans. What is citizenship within a social contract where a Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial can be suspended in the event of our completely legal but extrajudicial murder by the police? Black liberation poses an existential threat to white supremacy because the existence of free black people necessitates a complete transformation and destruction of the settler state. The United States cannot exist without black subjection, and in this way, articulated racial formations revolve in large part around anti-black regulations. It is impossible to reform the system of racial capitalism. Those who believe in and operate according to the laws of white supremacy are not solely white people, the beneficiaries are largely and mostly visibly white. The supporters of this system included an inter internally oppressed multiracial coalition. There are many politicians and state operatives of color, black and otherwise, working for white supremacy. Diversity in the seats of power will not solve our problems. Simply because someone shares race, gender, or another aspect of identity does not guarantee loyalty or that they will act in the best interests of black communities. We adopt a self-sacrificial politic in expressing openness or friendliness to the state because some of its functionaries look like us. U.S. political systems were not designed to meet our needs and sweetening our concerns with rhetorics of diversity and inclusion will merely enable nominal representation or mitigation of material harms in some cases, as opposed to liberation in any real sense. Because white supremacists helming the state understand the liberatory potential of black radicalism, these energies have been co-opted into safer and more respectable means of affecting change. Black America has become effectively trapped in the never-ending cycle of partisan politic between the actively antagonistic Grand Old Party and the Democratic Party that exploits black loyalty but offers few paths for any substantial improvement of the black condition. The U.S. political cycle and the inner workings of the election process clearly leave much to be desired. The people inside this hopeless maze of civic duty often feel so uninspired that they remove themselves from the process, choosing not to vote or otherwise engage in elections. This decision is not the failure of the people who choose not to participate, but a failure of the system itself. Whether most citizens can explain why the electoral college system has been a failure or why it works is of no consequence. Low voter turnout shows that participation feels like an empty gesture, and it is just that to a large extent, especially when political outcomes are manipulated by mass voter disenfranchisement, redistricting, and a system of indirect representation in democracy. The electoral college system is not a reliable vehicle for change, certainly not for much needed social transformation. At the 1787 Constitutional Convention, a popular vote count for president would have made states that predominantly relied on slavery much less likely to win national elections. The Electoral College, was, which was based on population, was seen as leveling the playing field. Subsequently, each state's decision to cast electoral votes has been in the hands of the electors who are not bound to vote the way the public did in the states they represent. The convention decided to count each enslaved person as three-fifths of a human, and this dehumanizing convenience became known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. This history of electoral college adheres in what takes place during national elections today. A candidate can be elected president of the United States despite another candidate receiving more votes overall. This was the case with George W. Bush's election in 2000 and then Donald Trump's victory over Hillary Clinton in 2016. States with more electors have an unequal power in a national election, which often feels far more like a calculated game than a democratic process serving to meet constituents' needs. Furthermore, electors, those who, who are selected to make up the Electoral College, are not bound by law to vote for the, for the candidate a state's voters have chosen. Our votes are symbolic, and the process doesn't necessarily result in victory for the people's choice. It doesn't even guarantee the commitment of the electors. 
Under the current system, in which Democratic and Republican Party are each invested, political discourse is constantly being pulled to the right. Liberals position themselves as the lesser of two evils against the Republicans in every election, banking on their electability as the arguably better choice while consistently failing to offer protective and supportive policies that counter Republican ones. This clearly demonstrates that the liberal establishment knows that this system is disempowering. It continues to encourage people to happily and willingly engage in the system while it effectively self-sabotages at each opportunity. When we allow the Democratic Party leaders to position the party as a moral authority against a worse party, we risk condoning all of what the less evil candidate represents. We participate in and perpetuate this cycle of disempowerment. The Democratic Party has grown increasingly conservative over the years due to this policy of compromise and lesser evilism. The party shifts to the right because it is, doesn't seek to portray itself as a real opposition, but only as an easy and unalienating alternative. The liberal class and establishment party politics here are partially responsible for the continued shift to the right, not only in this country, but also globally. U.S. politics are exported through the West and influence the climates of other countries that are susceptible to U.S. foreign policy's powerful influence. This is one of the many reasons a true left and a real opposition in this country is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, the right will continue to grow and its systemic influence and authoritarianism will naturally grow stronger, both within the government and outside of it. Because there is not a unified left in this country, the work of the scattered leftists is imperative. If we do not build that function, functionally cohesive left, or at least pragmatically recognize the necessity for intersectarian work, the rights of all people oppressed by capitalist white supremacy will inevitably continue to erode. Some might hope that tyrannical political trends that come with the aforementioned shift to the right can be useful to the left as a mobilizing and organizing impetus. One might think that a in a country with as much comfort as the United States, the mild to severe discomfort brought on by increasingly authoritarian discourses and policy might inspire people to fight harder. But attempting to coax people from their relative comfort zones and into the streets is difficult. The U.S. empire was an affront to humanity long before this political movement, and the problems we face today have existed for generations. Though we are admittedly not yet able to fully articulate or agree upon what it may look like, we ultimately work toward total and complete freedom. We do not just hope for it, we strive to realize it in any way that we can, and this cannot come from idealistic and ultimately empty representation of political heroes and saviors. Our ideas of what freedom and liberation mean to us must rest on something sturdier than the shoulders of charismatic and seemingly progressive politicians. We must define those for ourselves. We should not wait for the magic words we want to hear come out of someone else's mouth when we can designate, dictate, and deliver change ourselves. We should not sit back and wait for politicians to grant us our humanity, a humanity that has always existed and it should not be left to elections, political terms, or rating periods to determine whether or not we will see it actualized. Legendary singer Nina Simone once described freedom as, quote, no fear, a description that undoubtedly resonates with many. What does fear have to do with freedom? We know that when we and our communities and families are not guaranteed our humanity in the circumstances we need to flourish, we are often afraid, even terrified. To be without that fear could truly be gratifying, even liberatory. Fear pervades so many aspects of our everyday lives as black people. The fear of eviction, of police, of airport security, immigration enforcement, and illnesses we simply cannot afford to suffer. Uncertainty and the fear of being unsafe and not having the resources necessary to survive can consume us, leaving no time to work for the world we truly want to see. We become more consumed in work to save ourselves and our communities, rather than spending more time and resources on generative and rehabilitating work. A question arises from all of this. Which fear is greater, the fear of the pain we know or the pain we do not? Surely many would choose the latter as greater because the familiar pain seems more bearable, but our pain threshold is being pushed to its limits in a hamster wheel that seems to be spinning faster. We cannot even really claim the fear we know because this seems to be growing increasingly urgent. That leaves us with a suggestion brought on by circumstance to overcome our fears if we should choose in pursuit of something better, this is obviously either said than done. Defiance is scary, but we seem continuously headed in the wrong direction. What if we change course and embrace the unknown despite our fear? That would require a collective courage we have yet to draw upon en masse.